history of uh, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, uh, where she's been since 2008, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, she's seen that museum through its uh, construction, through its construction <laughs> and uh, installation, and uh, she has many publications. And I think she's going to talk about uh, today something related uh, to her most recent work uh, on the um, the actual title is Awaiting the Messiah. Uh, paintings in the synagogues of uh, Rudja and Polacy. Uh, uh, and Polacy. Oh, you do it. You do it. My Polish has never been good. Everyone knows that. So uh, that's fine. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Um, and uh, the first, I want to compare uh, to a construction of Polacy and Rudja, but it was impossible because uh, Polacy is still in the um, with the progress very, 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 at the very, very beginning. Also, I decided to, um, to look at the pictures which survived um, um, as uh, uh, copies um, uh, and compare uh, both programs of both uh, synagogues uh, only in one uh, goal uh, to look at these pictures as awaiting them as high. <laughs> because another thing did much more better than me. Uh, Professor Braha Janis, thank you for inspiration for everything. And, uh, uh, okay. Okay. I'm glad, dear Professor, that you urged me to draw it, the pupil I'm about it again, because it is truly unique, what Karol Maszkowski to his academic tutor towards the end of the 19th century. Their constructed vault of the synagogue in Bojdzic serves as a main attraction of the museum <coughs> in Warsaw. Uh, somebody says today about Michael, uh, Michelangelo. Uh, some people uh, who looked at our uh, cupola said that, oh, it's the, uh, the 16th chapel of the uh, museum. <laughs> uh, reconstruction of wooden chapel is currently being undertaken in the open air museum in Tsanok, and the synagogue of Poanitz will be one of its main features. Both buildings have been lucky enough to have another life. Gwojdzic and Poanitz were two small towns within the Polish um, uh, Lithuanian common, uh, Commonwealth, within the border of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. I want you to show where is the Poanitz and Gwojdzic. I will use this because it's easier for me. Here is uh, um, the small city, uh, Sandomierz, and here is Poanitz. Uh, Sandomierz, I mentioned because uh, it's very important to, to, for the next part of my lecture. And uh, here is the uh, Wojciec and uh, the another small city is Jabłonów, also important um, for this area. Uh, Poanitz was a real town located along the trade route from the capital in Kraków to Sandomierz, another real town. In 1789, approximately 23% of the houses belonged to the Jewish community, who engaged mostly in trade and managing transport of the grain on the river. Gwojciec, on the other hand, was a private town. The Jewish population of the town engaged mostly in trade along the country's borders and the distribution of products from Moldova and the Ottoman Empire. As you see, here was uh, uh, Moldova and Ottoman Empire. <coughs> uh, according to the census of 1765, Jews constitute circa 60% of the overall population. Despite significant changes in the town's status and occupations of its inhabitants, the process of building the synagogues in, in both towns was very similar. The first wooden synagogue was erected in Poanitz in 1647, similar to Bolshevik. We know that these synagogues were established throughout the Minsky program. In the 18th century, the synagogue in Bolshevik was rebuilt. The construction works were completed by 1729-1730. Uh, in Poanitz, the new synagogue was completed in 1744 and renovated in 1757. And here you see new um, synagogue of Poanitz in the uh, south of the air museum. Also, as I used to see, it's only the process is <laughs> the construction of the, uh, of the office building from outside. And <coughs> Poanitz uh, from outside, the projects from outside, inside, the projects inside Poanitz. The state of research. First of all, I wanted to apologize uh, with Braha and uh, Sergei. I didn't know that you work with Poanitz with the subject. Uh, because in Polish Bible of uh, wooden synagogues, uh, which is written by um, uh, Piechotka uh, marriage, uh, Piechotka Kapu, you, you weren't matched. You, <laughs> you must look at this, yes. 
Nuvesila uh, Gokin Vojits had significantly more luck than the one in Polanyi, as far as the researchers are concerned. Owing to precise iconographic material and description written down by Maszkowski, it was possible to reconstruct the iconographic program of the synagogue in Vojic. Of polychromies from Polanyi, we know only from what is left in 22 watercolors and two photographs. Therefore, a complete iconographic analysis of this building is simply not feasible. We can, however, aim at some sort of interpretation through all analogy to paintings in other synagogues. We can discern a significant consistency between painted decorations in both synagogues, despite the fact that they were located at a distance of 450 kilometers from each other. Historical context. As you see, uh, here there was in that time in Poland, and here there are uh, another problems, another events uh, which, which were very important. Uh, for Jewish life in that time. The period preceding the origin of paintings in both synagogues was full of unique, if often tragic events. The second half of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century was a period of impious accusations against Jews who allegedly engaged in ritual murder. In 1698, in some <coughs> kilometers from Poland, Jews were accused of murdering a Christian girl and in 1710 of murdering yet another child. As a result of these accusations, Jews were expelled from St. Domish, where archidiacon Stefan Żukowski was in charge of a widespread campaign against blood against the Jews. In 1730, he published a book under a very complex title, Criminal Trial about a Muslim child who were murdered by Jews in the year 1710 on the age of in St. Domish, etc., etc. In the same year, 1713, three Kahal officials were falsely accused and sentenced to death. Another accusation of ritual murder against Jews was made in this area in 1757, in the town of Michochi. Court reports pertaining to the region where Poland is located contain also numerous accusations of blasphemy directed towards Jews. Vojtis was located in the Kopuche region, on the borderlands. The region was famed for its multicultural ambience and offense towards other religions. On the other hand, internal heresies flourished. Proponents of Shabbat resided in the area. Due to a high number of herons imposed by the rabbinate, the majority of them concealed the fact that they um, considered Zvi as the Messiah. In 1699, a large group of Polish Hasidim left Poland in order to get to Jerusalem and greet the Messiah. However, the Messiah did not arrive. Some returned to Europe, where 13 of them converted to Christianity. Several years later, in approximately 1716, 30, mem 30 members of the sect accepted Baruchia Rousseau as God incarnated. Baruchia was supposed to that all religions based on the book, namely Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, contained a grain of revelation, which should be freed from their institutional shell and gathered together in one Torah. According to the account of Baruchia Dan from 1756, proponents of Sabbatai from Podolia referred to Baruchia's doctrine as an entirely new religion. It was supposed to command explanation, transcendence, and convergence of the three religions, Jewish, Islam, and Christian, in such a way that one chariot should be made of them. In 1758, on the other hand, 30 delegates accepted Jacob Frank as their god. This is the time when polychromies of the synagogue in Polanyi were just renovated. The first half of the 18th century was a time of messianic hopes and disappointments. In conjunction with missionary operation of German theaters in the Polish Catholic Church, some individuals engaged in messianic propaganda decided to be baptized. One of them was Moshe ben Aaron Hakoen, born in Krakow, who changed the name into Johann Kemper following his baptism. In commentary to Zohar, titled Mate Moshe ben Marka Yaakov, written in Hebrew in Uppsala, in the years 1702 to 1713, he tried to argue that the messianic faith of an old Jewish synagogue was the same as the Christian faith. His expression, to unite the Holy Blessed with his Shekinah, was in fact referring to the Holy, uh, to the Holy Trinity. As the Holy Blessed explained, it is the Father and also the Son, and the Holy Spirit both reside in the world of Shekinah. The third section of this uh, commentary is titled Shah Metatron and discusses Metatron commonly associated with Jesus Christ. Recalling Metatron must have been quite common at the time, in the Abunu synagogue, located in the Fire and on the Eastern Wall, where is, uh, there is an inscription from the year 1727. Owing to the merits of three fathers, let my pleas be delivered with the help of Metatron so that God, in his mercy, would hear and accept them. One of the people accused of the Sabbath <coughs> was Jacob Frank's father. Jacob was born in 1726, most probably in Nervi Korolovka. Year after he was born, the labor of his family had to flee the Commonwealth. 
Frank and his supporters became active within the Commonwealth borders in the second half of the 1750s. In August 1756, they wrote a manifesto which they sent to the Bishop of Canines. They later read, Jerusalem, a city in accordance with the prophecy, will not be rebuilt. The Messiah, promised in the book, will not come. In September of that year, Prat Arbara Tzot confirmed the harem imposed by rabbinical court on the supporters of Shabbat Aizmi, Nathan of Gaza, and Baruch Yerusha. Paintings in both synagogues were produced at the time of anxiety and unrest and in the period of increased expectation for the arrival of the Messiah. Some people, a very popular roving preacher, as Vivi Hirsch quite another, amongst them claimed that the Messiah would arrive in the north, that is in Poland. In a collection of his sermons <coughs> entitled Kafka Yashar, published in Frankfurt and Main in 1705, Koidonov, recalling the words of Shabbatai's prophet, Herschel Tzoy, referred to the citation from the book of Jeremiah. From the north, it shall open. The feminine connected with the expectation of the Messiah was reflected in the polychromies of the synagogues. Owing to the inscription, we can determine who produced the original old paintings in the Vosges. The authors of the paintings from the 17th century were Isaac Bell and his son, whereas the paintings from the 18th century were produced by Itzhak Ben Yehudalei Kakoen and Israeli Schmitz, both from Yerichu. Unfortunately, we don't know how to get the information from the paintings from the Poland. So far, the authors remain anonymous. Thanks to two photographs and watercolor copies, we can make an attempt at iconographic interpretation of the paintings from Poland. A heart set up by an eagle. As you see, this, this heart set up by an eagle. Another heart uh, <coughs> uh, is keeping his ears low and scooching, listens intensely with his head turned to side. The unicorn is presented in a similar fashion. He is standing still and turning his head, he seems to be listening intensely as well. Other unicorns in the synagogue seem to be already running along the Garden of Eden. A sea monster, Leviathan, Leviathan is embracing Jerusalem. A snake is entwining a stall, but he cannot do anything, as the stork is holding the snake's head in his long beak. An eagle with his beak open and his wings stripped out is taking off as if he was singing a song of praise. A spirit is marching on an up. There are also zodiac signs. Um, and flowers resembling a rosette. All the elements, just like on the woven carpets, are entwined with the campus leaves, great vine, stylized edelweiss, lilies, and water. A similar set of imagery is present in the painting of the Bogit Synagogue. There is a Leviathan in Tunic, Jerusalem. <coughs> and hearts, which are presented in three different ways. Analogically to the painting of one, they are uttered by eagles. Sides here. Mm -hmm. uh, or are presented as shikar or baby house. Um, on the pedantic below the Leviathan, no longer you see with this pedantic. The three hearts conjoined by the ears form a triangle. Images of unicorns in Vosges are far more static. The depiction of a unicorn putting its horn into a lion's mouth is analogical to one of the images in Poland. The two unicorns located on the western panel are placed on the medallions in a representative heraldic fashion. Two squares fitting on nuts were placed on the medallions of the eastern panel. Here they are. Flanking a flower which resembles a rosé. Similar to the paintings in, from Hawaii, polychromies from Virgil's create an association with decorated textiles which adorn the walls of modern manor houses. The majority of the image in both synagogues have a hidden meaning. Reference to Mishnah is the most obvious one. Two of analogies to the synagogue in Yabwomu, where the following inscription can be found. This inscription, this inscription was described by Wyszbicki in the 19th century. Up there we can see a lion and an inscription just above him, as strong as a lion, and below is a panther. A panther and inscription as brave as a panther. On the left, a deer and description as a giant as a deer. On the bottom, an eagle and description as fast as an eagle. People at that time should have continued this first Mishnah in order to fulfill the will of the Father who is in heaven. In the cupola um, talking of the synagogue is the floral motif resembling the rosette. The same motif is in Poanit synagogue. Here is from Poanit. Mm -hmm. 
we may venture to interpret this motive as a solar symbol. Quotation which can be read from the synagogue in Vojic may help in its, in its interpretation. The quotation, Rabbi Simeon ben Lakish said, he who responds Amin with all his might has the gates of paradise open for him. In Sarkos, the Easter Tower, in the middle of it, there is a middle room with a floral motif resembling a rosette, similar to spire. The spire, as we well know, is the eldest motif symbolizing connection between the earthly life with the heavenly existence, due to the fact that, the, that it starts from one point and continues until infinity. Lightning spirits are traditionally compared to wise men trying to absorb the wisdom of the Torah. An art in mystical text indicates it by their pure knowledge in order to retrieve its fruit, one must remove the, the layers which envelop it. It is similar with retrieving the meaning of the Torah. In order to reach its most vital mystical skill, one needs to first get to know its text verbatim. The numeric values of the word Ha is symbolic. The term Shatan, 300 plus 80 plus 50 equals 430, is also the value of the word Nefesh, 50 plus 80 plus 300 equals 430. So, life person. Has also had very good hearing. They would truly be the first creatures to hear the sounds of the shofar and the arrival of the Messiah. However, the images of Haas conjoined by the ears, those creating a triangle, as can be seen in voices, is rather unique. It is this presentation. It's, uh, it's an ancient symbol often associated with peace and tranquility. A neighboring pedantry depicts yet another triangle created by three fishes, regarded as a symbol of unity, and on the other hand, hand uh, associated with Christianity, where a fish symbolizes the soul of Jesus Christ. This is the second one from the pedantry. It's the Golden of Mashkos. And the same presentation in the uh, Polanyets. And here is only curiosity. You know, it's uh, the program which is uh, uh, in the whole world about this uh, kind of presentation from the very, very beginning, from the old case to, to, to in our time. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, both cars and fishes show the one in three and three in one. It would seem that it was connected to the religious syncretism quite popular at the time, as well as with seeking and attracted Shekinah in non-Jewish cycles. The sea monster, monster is represented in a very similar way in both synagogues. Its presence serves first and foremost as a reference to messianic times, to the grandest reward for the just, and to the reminder that the rewarded ones will all meet in Jerusalem. When the Messiah comes, the just will consume the meat of a sea monster. Its skin will be stretched by God on the walls of the Jerusalem temple, and its opulence will shine from the beginning to the end of the world. And here is the translation of this quotation of the Rebellion in The unicorn's horn symbolizes the Shofar, which will announce the arrival of Messiah on Rosh Hashanah. Here is this presentation of unicorn, very similar to presentation here. Very difficult to see because these pictures, they are in good. <coughs> the arrival was to happen in the year 1695. The rabbis claimed that on this day, the 5th of September 1695, an unimaginative eclipse of the sun will take place, so that the true Shekinah will become visible, the light of the glory of glorious God, an enormous shine which will descend on the world to enlighten everyone who is willing to see and to meet the Messiah and to live in his life. The eclipse was to last for three days. After this, darkness has succeeded. The Messiah is to come and reveal himself. So what Moshe Aaron provides Johan Kemper. This relation to Rosh Hashanah is also confirmed in the role of zodiac signs in Vojins. The panel is adorned with a Libra, which goes with the mouth of Tishri in the mouth of uh, the New York Falls. In the same role is also Scorpio in the mouth of Heshvan, the eighth mount. When the Messiah comes, the third temple will also be built in Heshvan. So this is likely. are also confirmed by the wording of a prayer on the panel. Blessed be the Lord forever, Amen, and Amen, Amen in this world, and Amen in the world to come. Analogically, an identical image of a unicorn and a lion on the road of the synagogue in Poanis can be interpreted in the same way. Other unicorns in Vojic are, are, are presented in a more formal fashion, as if they had a message to convey to the world. 
the just those who pray urgently will live to, to see the world that is about to come. The quotation on the panel with the unicorns and the medallions reads, etc. Johanna, when the Holy One, blessed be he, enters a synagogue and does not find there ten men, he immediately becomes angry. And on the bottom part of the cupola, an inscription can be read. Rabbi Joshua ben Levi said, He who responds, Amen, may his great name be blessed with all his might, his decreed sentence is thrown out. The sentence may refer to the chosen ones who know how to pray. Below, below this, this presentation, in the west wall, uh, uh, on, on the wall, we have in this little slide of Mary Museum, it's a pity. Um, it was better to see this construction, and here should be the wall. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, it, was, it was located a stroke swelling to a snake next to the image of a symbolic gate to Jerusalem. As you see from the book of Moshkos, here this, this presentation of, uh, uh, of um, uh, a stroke very similar to the quality, to the plants. The stroke in Hebrew Hasidah is derived from the word Hesed, <coughs> the stroke's givers are mostly white, and white is traditionally the color of grace. The stroke is also mentioned in the book of Jeremiah as a symbol of obedience and fulfilling God's commandments. On one of the watercolor copies uh, from Hawaii, a strange beast is consuming leaves from the tree of life, which is also a <coughs> reference to life in the world to come. It is difficult to talk about the shared iconographic program of life to synagogues at that time. However, as Maszkowski wrote, all the inscriptions which are here in Bolgitz relate almost directly to the inscriptions in the synagogue in Yabłowie. Such specific and precise information of inscriptions in the Polanian synagogue has not been preserved. However, social and historical events were widely reflected, and preachers often traveled from one center to another, delivering the same sermons. Hence, to, hence the similarity of iconographic depictions in synagogues, in, which were located even hundreds of kilometers away. Since the night in the 17th century, Jews residing in the Commonwealth were subjected to violence by the soul. People sought explanation for these unexpected tragic events. For many, it seemed obvious that such normal shock must herald the arrival of Messiah. The thousand old waiting for Messiah intensified significantly, hence the messianic symbolism and references to the future life, which dominated the decorations of synagogues. Horror vacuity, so typical of the Baroque people, can be sensed in the decorations of both synagogues. It was entirely understandable, taking into consideration the social context and events of the time. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one more speaker, so let's just take one question and then we can hold all other questions to the end. Uh, if there's one quick question, that was such a dense talk, there was so much information, I think it will take us needs to absorb. I hope that we'll see that in uh, very soon. Okay. Okay.